Hi everybody, this is Marilyn and I'm joined here by my amazing better half, better Rhea. half, Rhea Shadid. Thank you. AKA Razy. Thank you. AKA Rayos. But guys, Rhea will not be the star of the show tonight because we're joined by the amazing Blue Pfeiffer. Woo! We're like totally fangirling and we're super fangirling. Incredibly excited that you joined us. We've been talking about this for the last two weeks. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm really happy to be talking to you guys today. Blue, for those in our audience who are living under a rock and don't know who you are, give us the the elevator pitch. So, hello. My name is Blue Pfeiffer. I'm half Lebanese, half Mexican. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, director, and pole dancer. Yes. Amazing. Love it. And you recently came out with a single Sintel Eo, that's making the waves. Making the waves. On the Everybody's online. talking about it. I saw today there was a dance challenge. There's yeah, a dance challenge. Yeah, that's super crazy. But before we start diving into all the topics, uh, how are you doing? How are you feeling with all that's been going on? COVID. I mean, the shitstorm that is Lebanon. What's how? Yeah. Are you, how are you feeling? It's been such an intense year. I think everybody can relate to that statement for sure, which is what led me to write about the song. It's been very intense. It's, yeah, I feel like it's been a very transformative year and I feel like everybody's kind of been forced to deal with their own shit and everyone's been put in all these situations and, you know, staying at home and the crisis and probably losing your savings or your work and having to think differently, actually, you know, having to perceive and make decisions in, on a completely different way than we used to do it before. Before. So it's been quite a transformative year. I'm, I'm really grateful with how things are developing for me in my career because I did not expect this year to be my year at all. <laughs> It was not my year. That's how things are going. Yeah, I mean, we had Thanksgiving, yesterday. a very controversial holiday, but we still had a Thanksgiving dinner yesterday and, and we went around kind of talking about what we were grateful for. And I think this year has really taught us what we can be thankful for and, and, and taught us also not to keep looking outside for fulfillment. Yeah, and, so. and kind of keeping that gratitude jar full whenever we can. It yeah. kind of got us through this year, is getting us through this year. But coming back to the song that you put out, I think it's the first song that you do fully in Arabic. I know you have a few Arabic lyrics here and there, Pringled in your previous uh, work. Tell us about how you got here, the creative process, how long has it been in the works? What did you feel while you were creating it? If I want to start from the beginning of where I kind of, you know, because as a singer living in Lebanon for most or if not all of my career, I do always get the question of why don't you sing in Arabic? Why aren't you singing in Arabic? You're from here. You live here. You speak Arabic fluently. Like why? You know, my relationship with Arabic culture and my relationship with Arabic music has changed a lot. Growing up, we had to leave the country. My references weren't always Arabic. I always associated Arabic to becoming something that I didn't want to be come or to talk about painful things that I felt like we were trying to run from as a generation. As the years went by, I had written Girls Gotta Eat. I was really excited about having this Spanish sentence for my Mexican heritage and I felt like that was so cool. Every time somebody would ask me what that sentence meant, mandale saludos a tu madre, the actual translation is... So I'd be like, it's Salim Le Aumak. And the reaction that I would get every single time was so funny. And so I recorded it as a joke. And when we were exporting all the, all the files, I had sent it to Jenna, my co-producer on my EP, The Prelude, Jenna Saleh. And she was like, you should totally keep it. And I'm like, are you serious? What do you mean? <laughs> like, she's like, you should keep it. And I'm like, I should keep it. I should keep it. And then I kept it. Ever since I started doing shows, it's that sentence that everybody waited for. You know, I, I felt that energy and it really fed me. And I thought, okay, I don't have to sell out to do Arabic. I don't have to sound like someone else. I don't have to censor myself. One thing led to another. And I started listening to more Arabic music. And eventually the revolution started, which like was the final tipping toe for me. Because that story specifically of the revolution in the past year and everything that's happening in Lebanon, I personally 
felt like it was the only choice was to tell it in Arabic. I needed to do it unapologetically and I needed to do it in a way that was reflective of the reality, which is there is this whole conversation about censorship and there's this whole conversation of before, like we couldn't swear because we wanted to position ourselves in a certain way in the revolution. And then after the explosion, just no one gives a shit anymore because everyone's so tired and that's not really the prior. So I felt like that was the best way of connecting everything. I love that it was in Arabic because ever since October, October, there was kind of this reawakening of Arabic and people started using it and, and kind of explaining what's going on politically, socially, financially in Arabic. I started learning words because I grew up between the U.S. and Lebanon as well. And so I would also have this thing of staying away from Arabic. And then all of a sudden, ever since October, it's like, no, this sh we should be talking in Arabic. Your song proves that there's also a hunger for Arabic content, but not the Fusha Arabic, the Arabic that we speak. So the fact that you were able to tap into that and also <laughs> with that song. Yeah. I don't even know how to say that in English. You brought out that anger that could only be told in our in language. language. Yeah, I mean, I fell off my chair the first time uh, Rea came from one of... Because I wasn't... I, w I haven't been in Lebanon for a couple years, for a few years, seven years. But the first time Rea came and she was singing something in Arabic, I'm like, Uh, what the hell just happened to you? But I think that because you chose to do it in Arabic, it's even more powerful because it's not hiding from anyone. And, and sometimes when culturally we choose to speak in English or in French, we're sort of isolating from the broader context that we're within and maybe also protecting ourselves. Uh, and I think that and it was also. that much more powerful that you did it in a language that everyone can understand now and that there's no hiding behind anything. It was really funny. So... A friend of mine came over, you know, a few weeks back and she was showing me your Instagram and just kind of telling me that just watching you makes her feel very powerful, right? And makes her feel unapologetic. This morning I was singing like the first, you know, lyrics from your song. Uh, so whatever, I was saying, And then my friend's like, I'm sure she doesn't say that. I'm like, yeah, no, she does. She's like, what? So she put it back and we listened to it. She's like, yeah, you know, like she was, she was so happy yeah. about that. You guys made two points that I think are very important because first of all, you said things have changed since October 17th. To having these conversations with other people, I'm realizing maybe before enduring what we have endured this past year or past few years in our generation that kind of went through the big wars and stuff through memories of our you know parents and grandparents I used to feel like I don't have the right to talk about these things and I feel like this whole awakening that has happened in the past year socially not just you know politically has given me like okay no like I belong here just as much as the next person because I go through this shit as much as the next person. So why should I suffer from a kind of shame from being westernized in a way? It's actually a result of what we go through in this country. So I, I started understanding that a lot of people feel this way. I think seeing someone like me who was doing things that were, you know, mainly in English and presenting myself in a, you know, non-Orientalist way necessarily, and then seeing me completely own my context gave a lot of people that the confidence of like okay this is part of our reality this is part of our music this is part of our community and and you said it's really cool that you're singing in a way that is not in fusha necessarily and i actually had to make that choice i speak in arabic every day why can't i write in the way that i actually speak with my friends because i'm sure that there's a lot of people that relate to that it gives me the ability to think about me writing in arabic or making arabic music in a way more sustainable way if i'm actually writing what i want to say and in the way that i want to say it than if i have to you know like hire 20 writers every time and be super philosophical and just you know that's just not in that way that's not who i am you know so and it's writing yeah. from from emotion and also like we're talking about the language used but also the content that's in the song is so powerful because you're calling everything out you're literally being like and this and this like I was saying like to, to Marilyn the other day my my favorite <laughs> line is it's brave and I think the fact that you resonated with Marilyn's friend so much it's because that courage that you're presenting is infectious and it's the way people want to be especially today in 2020 so my question for you Besides the Arabic, when you wrote the actual content, were you scared to release it? Especially now, 
as the the government is closing their ranks on the people where it's becoming even more of a police state in Lebanon where calling people to the mahakim to the to the judiciary court like now is quite a a risky time to kind of launch the song actually i obviously i was the one that was the most concerned about this because it's you know my voice my song my face at the end of the day and i wrote the song with like my best friends with maggie who's my agent wasim who's like one of my closest friends and we had a lot of these conversations was i scared um yes i was really shocked that every time i would bring up a concern to anybody around me they'd be like you know don't worry about it you're not saying names you know don't worry about it but I, you know i'm always really worried about that because i ha- i have been in situations like that in the past so i was afraid yes but did that mean that it was ever a possibility for me not to release the song no it didn't it خلص يعني by the time it was made and i could envision what it could sound like and look like it, it it's no longer a choice it's more like it's done like i should have not thought about this <laughs> before i heard it and i was like fashit li khil'a like you said there isn't that word in english and i say that all the time fashit li khil'a to the point where i felt like there's no way that i don't even if it's not everyone even if it's just a handful of people that betfashilun khil'un like i so want to give them that moment the way that the song gave me cuz i had no other purpose for a while the song totally centered me gave me purpose you know it was the only song that i could listen to for a while because with everything happening it was really hard to identify with the things that i used to before I'm really just saying what's happening. It's you know, I do give my opinion at, at the end of the second verse, but I'm literally saying like it's 2020, things are fucked. Am I making this up? No. So if you don't like the sentence, you know, that's about how we all feel about the situation. I don't like it either. You know, I don't like that I had to make a song like this. I don't like that I'm having to redo a song that was done 20 years ago and we're still talking about same shit, worse shit, even worse shit. Like I don't want to be in that situation. So whenever someone says, "I don't like that you said this" or whatever, I go like, "I didn't make anything up, so take it up with the other guy." <laughs> well, Fair point. Yeah. I mean, I think in that sense, look for me as an expat and having sort of had my own years of deciding how i wanted to contribute and and raise my voice and be loud in lebanon and for me it was going manifesting for women's rights and so on but in that sense and and whether you like it or not sadly you're be you're a symbol of the fact that we can now say what we think like i remember 10 years ago i spoke to a friend of mine who was a great illustrator and i'm like listen i have this brilliant idea i want us to do a like an illustrated see fictional series about how about like these avengers type people and how each politician dies and he was like you're going to put us in jail i was like all right fine and so we didn't end up doing it but for me it was like cuz no one would dare do it with me but raya i know you're going to be putting out a second podcast that's pretty daring but in my sense blue like you're symbolic of a wave that has brought us to a place where we're no longer afraid to say what we think and about empowerment and all of these things like they're kind of not necessarily what you intended but they they end up being how you make other people feel and i was wondering if, how you feel about that today first of all thank you i really ho- i hope that i can live up to all of these you know beautiful statements you know as an artist and as a writer i feel like one of the two most amazing things and the biggest honors is empowering people to be themselves or to talk about what they do want to talk about but there's just something in the way so if i can, can contribute to somebody feeling like they can express themselves better or they can be themselves or not to care so much about what other people think if they're convinced about who they want to be or what they want to do or say that is really the highest honor if i were to place myself in a narrative of every move that i make i have to empower or have this responsibility i think that's a very stressful environment as an artist to develop in the concept of that that i'm reaching is more like me doing what works for me no matter what that means every step of the way can be empowering to somebody else i really don't try to feed a certain narrative you know you guys are obviously like an amazing you know feminist platform and i c- consider myself a proud feminist but i don't go out and look for feminist 
articles and magazines and news because that's always where I'm placed. I don't knock on these doors. It's just that I connect with those, you know, like-minded people. I I'd love for these platforms to become a redundant existence because that would mean that we wouldn't have this problem anymore. Obviously, that's not the world we live in, you know, unfortunately. So it's my highest honor to hear that from you or from anyone because I know what it's like to have something touch you so much to the point where it reflects on who you are and, and what you want to be and how you know how you want to carry yourself I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't agree with you but you know that's their problem <laughs> to what you said I mean this idea that empowerment is a second order effect of you just being yourself I think is an incredible powerful thing to say and that is exactly the reason why you don't intimidate people but you make them feel powerful because you're not trying to tell them to be like you or behave like you or want the same things as you you're trying to tell them that no matter where you are on sort of the bell curve of society no matter how much of an outlier you are it don't matter I'm going to be myself fully and you can do the same thing and I totally agree with you that that is what makes them feel powerful oh it's huge the line you you repeat in the song is but they kun fakhura I want to be proud and that that's the recommendation you gave at the end and I think that pride comes from yes being in a country that's functional but also that pride comes from it within and that pride comes from just loving yourself and being yourself and I actually think that the most successful revolutions actually start on an individual level where you have the revolution from inside of you and you develop that power from inside of you so by inspiring that you're kind of pushing people yes to want to be themselves but also to create a community and a society that's gonna stand on its own two feet that part in the song when we first wrote it i remember seeing it on paper i had so many options for that part i ended up developing that like sad outro later but when I read those words it didn't hit me right in a way and then I remember Wasim was like just sing it you know sing all of these lines and see what you connect with and then I was like okay and I kicked everyone out of the room and I did that part I, I, I think I repeated it like more than a hundred times and I was just bawling, I was just crying. I, I felt so understood by those lines. But in a very sad way because that is how I feel. You know, in the song I'm complaining and I'm saying this is happening and that's happening and blah, blah, blah. But I'm also saying like, but I'm trying. Like I've been trying. Like I've been here for 10, you know, more than 10 years, career wise, 10 years, I've been here and I'm trying and I want to be better. And I spend all my time and resources investing and in how to become a better artist, a better person, living off of my music, even getting to that point seems to be impossible. You know, I want to be proud. I want to be proud of where I am and, 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 and what's around me and what I'm doing. But you, you make that so difficult and you make you're making me feel like it's impossible. I just want to be happy and fulfilled. Do you think you'll be able to stay in Lebanon? You know, if you ask me this week, I'm doing great. But then ask me next week, I'll probably want to get out and leave and I'll go like, where am I going to go? The topic of leaving Lebanon is a toxic relationship. You don't want to leave, but staying here is like bucket of shit every day. And then you want to leave and that comes with a whole bigger bucket of shit. And that's if you have the option of leaving or if you have the resources for me to just think about buying a plane ticket out of here, like just having a plane ticket on my hand and that I'd have to pay in dollars, let's say 500 to a thousand You're talking about numbers like 15 million and 20 million Lebanese pounds. That's not realistic. Nobody that's that's buying anything that's in dollars is making their living in dollars. Realistic planning when it comes to leaving this country is, is so slim and so difficult and so challenging, especially for anyone who's in the creative field or anybody who gets paid in Lebanese pounds. So I don't know. I mean, I just I've, I've come to the conclusion that I'm here for as long as I'm here. And I'm going to make the best out of that, which is what Sintileo was. And I just go like, how can I maximize what I have? How can I make the best out of what I have? Because I'm not going to sit around all day and complain waiting, you know, for somebody to come and save me. It's sad, but it makes you such a bigger hustler. I actually, how about we, we go on the other side of hate and go on the side of love of the place? Tell me about your fondest memory performing. All the shows, I've had shitty shows, I've had 15 people shows. I'm always so grateful for everybody that's there. The mo There's nothing more important than fulfilling the music and giving the people that are there the time of their lives. My favorite show, I don't know, but when you say that, it makes me think of my uh, EP release show at Ballroom Blitz. 
It was insane. The EP had been out like, I don't know, six days or something. Everybody was singing the words and there was this insane, insane energy. I just like remember not wanting to leave. I think I did Girls Gotta Eat like three times. Or or singing Ejit al Shorta in Hamra when we did the Music is Louder concert, which was in support of all the backlash that Mishra Leila was getting and, you know, all this censorship terrible things that that were happening that was my first time singing Arabic in front of uh, an audience and I was really nervous and I was singing a song that is tied to a very painful experience to sing it in front of 2,000 to 3,000 people in the same area where I was arrested that was just like life-changing for me do you mind telling us that story for people who might not know it a while ago so if uh I don't even know how many, I lost track now, but many, many years ago, I was in a situation where I was in, you know, the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, in this country, people get, uh, that get prosecuted or that get dragged into situations, it's not always fair. You don't always have your rights. So I was kind of put in a very life-changing situation, very painful situation, very traumatic situation. I was kind of living in a la-la land about, I knew we, you know, obviously I lived in Lebanon and everything, but I had never really had tough experience with law enforcement, with the government, with how things work, with how complicated and corrupt and disgusting things are. It was really like my first experience with that and I was quite young. And that happened in Hamra. You know, when I did Ejit Shorta in Hamra, which is where it had happened for me, that song is me talking about a lot of that it's an abstract song but just for me I know like I know what I'm saying so my family my mom and dad were front row and I, I didn't know that my dad was going to make that show because he doesn't live here and I was really I was shaking and at some point I, I wasn't really sure how people are going to receive it because it was my first time singing in Arabic and as soon as I said the first two words most of the room joined me and they were like singing for me and I felt really supported and I felt like I wasn't alone and What a full circle moment. And I think what's yeah. beautiful with that is that art and music and literature and all these things, when done from a place of vulnerability and a place of power and a place of acceptance, you realize how many people actually relate and have gone through similar things. I've been struggling a lot with body image issues. And I remember I did a, a live talk show in the US and I talked about it. And I got off stage and I kid you not, like 40 people came up to me and was like, me too. For me, in my mind, it was like something that I'm the only one who's been through this. But when you get up on stage and you say it, which is what you're doing every single day, it kind of brings people together and makes people ready to fight and to, to accept themselves and to kind of move forward. So I think that's really, that's really beautiful and very, again, courageous. I think there's a power in in finding out that you're not alone about something. I think that that's where our revolution started. Me learning that I'm not alone in the world about so many things that I used to feel like. So I'm a pole dancing teacher. That's my day job. So I have students that sometimes they do a move and then they look at me and they go, did I do it right? And I'm like, there's like a, a four meter mirror in front of you. You killed it. Why can't you see that the way I see it? And you know, they're just there to feel good about themselves. They're just there to be like, I, I want to feel the way that I think you feel. You know, we have this whole you know, ideas of what we think a person like me or somebody else is, but it's really not, not a reality. I, I, I struggled and I still struggle from so many body image issues and eating disorders. And like, I'm not at all a stranger to any of those things. It's always like, oh, you, you feel like that? I'm like, yeah, pole dancing changed my life. I could not have imagined going into a room and, you know, having to take off half my clothes because you need to have skin to grip on the pole. So for people who don't know, it's not just because people want to feel sexy and feel naked. It's because we technically need our skin to grip on the pole or we will slide. You know, I would just look for the corner that wasn't lit and I just find ways to hide myself behind the pole or somewhere. It would just be unfathomable like to do this as a workout Like, are you crazy? Three times a week, I'm supposed to expose myself like that to people. And it's such a supportive environment. And then eventually you stop caring what they look like and what you look like. And you just have fun. And, and then slowly you go like, that didn't look so bad. And then I think I can look at myself. No, maybe tomorrow. And then I'm sure so many girls feel that way. And when I tell my students these stories, they're like, what do you mean? You're crazy. You're gorgeous. I'm like, you, you, you don't, you're gorgeous. That, that actually gives me courage because I've been working out. And a lot of times it's my, my shirt gets in the way of when I'm working out. Today, like I was pushing a tire and my shirt was kind of like going up. I've always wanted to just work out in my bra, but I was always so ashamed to do that. Like there's no way that I can just 
take off my shirt and work out in my bra just like all those i'm not fit enough i'm not pretty enough blah 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 and so now i'm like actually just just do it because everyone probably feels exactly the same way I love that. You know, I've never had these kind of body issues. I was very lucky to be raised by a mom who um who's always like naked in front of me. And like it was it wasn't a thing. There was no shame around her body. And I always joke actually, I think I'm taller and thinner than I actually am because she's tall, I'm not. So I project my body onto hers. Um and I always feel like taller and thinner. And then I'm like, "Well, actually, Marilyn, you know, maybe you should lose some weight because <laughs> you're not that tall." No, you You look great. You both look phenomenal. And I know it's never when somebody gives me a compliment it's always like thank you but it doesn't really that's actually one of the main things that I learned now recently in the past week because of how much so I'm obviously my song came out and I've been exposed to more people than I ha- have ever been and so I'm reading a lot of more opinions about who I am than I used to before. I went through the motions. I did the whole like I'm so angry that that's not true, that's lies. And then going like I don't care what since when do I care? Like I went through all of these motions. You know, eventually realized it's crazy because if I ever read something that I don't agree with or that I don't like or that gets to me, I will completely just focus on what that is. And in parallel, there's like 20,000 comments coming in about how amazing the song is, how great I am, how much they love me and I'm just like focused on this one random account that they don't matter it's it's more about how we feel about ourselves i should be so grateful that i'm getting a message from Nadine Labake who's like one of my biggest idols i should be grateful that you know Nabila who's the news anchor at the beginning of the video who i love she you know she she loves she likes the piece so i'm like why am i focusing on these things that don't matter about these people that have never even done half of the things that i've achieved what's beautiful about what you just said it's also a choice using this time of the pandemic and the shitstorm that is Lebanon to actually create something beautiful out of that to choose to focus on the positive messages and to tell the negative messages to go fuck themselves right. to be grateful and it's a choice to be vulnerable it's a choice to be brave and and to release the, the songs it's a choice to also be yourself and to show yourself to the world people do have agency and they can choose to live the life they want to be and they can choose to be themselves and i think there's nothing more revolutionary than that i do i do agree with you but i, I also want to add that thing about positive you know positivity and hope as a concept this year really tested me because I am someone who wants to be positive at some point it felt insulting like stop telling me that things are going to be okay like fuck our fucking city blew up what what do you mean or struggling from certain like mental issues that don't allow you to always make the right choices when it comes to your mental health for me personally it's not just a choice to be positive but i think it's more about like to choose who do i want to be like how do i want to be dealing with this pandemic you have the people that were like let's do super productive things and then you have you have the people that were watching people doing productive things but they felt like shit because they were depressed and anxious and stuff you know and then they would feel bad opening instagram and seeing all these people cooking and whatever and and i actually had a productive but i also had a lot of people around me that really struggled in that time and they were so triggered by seeing everyone doing so well because they're like i'm not okay and i want to be able to say that i'm not okay and i want to be able to to say that I'm not making the best out of it and I'm really not okay and I need help. I just always feel that it's important to point out like when positivity is mentioned to validate people's struggle and you know if they don't have the privilege of feeling that way, you know. We did this episode where I'm more on the corporate side of the world and so on LinkedIn it was going around like oh yeah if you come out of this pandemic and you haven't started the company you want to start and whatever then you're lazy. Yeah. And so one day I said that in a show I'm just that person I'm the person who's going to get up and do shit and as you say I'm lucky I've been through enough in my life that I've learned how to process very fast yeah. and I fully comprehend that that's terrifying to most people and then a few people came back to us and they're like I feel pressured by you and so we did an episode where it was like things we're not doing in the pandemic we listed all the stuff that everybody was pressuring us to do like 20 minute workouts in my living room or sourdough bread <laughs> to go back i think it's also a choice of accepting yourself and what you're feeling the good the bad the ugly i think that's the real choice is to choose to be kind to yourself if today's a, you feel shitty that's okay yes it is a choice to accept 
it's a choice every day. And sometimes I'm just like, I don't know if I can do it today. And, and my mom has this thing that she tells me when I'm really overwhelmed or, you know, I can't take it anymore in my head or even work or whatever. She goes, let the world fall down today. You'll wake up tomorrow and you'll pick it up. Nobody in the world has ever gotten to where they want to get to from the get-go. Every person in the world has failed a billion times. So why are we so hard on ourselves when we fail? That's what I always tell myself is like, stop being so judgmental. Because people yeah. only show off their successes. Oh my God, we could have a three-hour conversation about this. It's not that people only show off their successes. I get triggered by this because like, I have a whole story I, on a very different spectrum than yours, but I relate so much to what you're saying um, around how people tell your story back to you. It's actually a great quality of humanity that, that our brain functions in a way that it only tries to remember good things. Chemically, our brain is constantly working to forget the bad stuff. That's why we can get over our PTSD from everything we've been through. But it also means that when you listen to other people's stories, they might have said, I was very successful or this or my song did really well or this creative process led me here. You might have in the middle said, but it was hard and I struggled and I didn't sleep. But in, in three months, you tell them to tell you that story again and they won't remember the stuff in the middle. It's not that you only show the positives to others. Blue, I mean, you've been so open right now about every shade of gray that, that you've been through. When people see somebody who's successful, they want to tell a linear story. And no matter how much you try to correct that linear story, it's what they'll remember. And that's what they project back at you. And I guess that's the responsibility of you know, being who you are. And you'll always struggle with that, you know. I, I guess you're right, but I, I think because I'm understanding like both point of views because I do agree with what you're saying. That is a lot of the times what people remember and them telling the story back to you is so much about them and how they perceived it and how they process it. So rarely does anybody pick up the phone and take a picture of them while they're down and post it and be like, you know, I had a shitty day yesterday or like this failed or I got fired or like I got dropped from this label or like, you know, nobody talks about that. So it's always a kind of a, a really unrealistic shape of what a person's life can look like. It's important to talk about the fact that things are not one dimensional and people can be struggling with different things and they could look differently. Like my worst, worst mental state was when I looked the baddest. Honestly, it was when I shot Girls Gotta Eat and it was when the EP show was out. It was the worst time in my personal life. I was not eating. I was starving myself. I was, compl I was depressed. I wasn't sleeping. I was crying all the time. But you know, people see this badass bitch and girls got to eat and it empowers them. So I'd like to remember it as a positive experience. But it's also important to note like, yeah, no, that was the lowest point in my life. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Thanks for having the courage to share that. Yeah. Actually, we really Thanks. appreciate that. It's a, no, I, it's a I, I appreciate that. I can just say whatever I want. I can swear. I can talk about things that might be shocking. You know? So I really appreciate you guys allowing me to be as raw as I was. And our audience thanks you in advance because this is really what inspires them in you. And so we're just really glad to be able to tell that story uh, through our show. To our audience, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you listen to Blue's song, Sintel Eo, and all her other amazing, amazing tracks. You can follow Blue on at Blue Pfeiffer. B-L-U-F-I-E-F-E-R. Yeah. Also, while you're at it, you can follow, follow us. us at Who Run The World Pod on Instagram. And if you want to write to us and talk about the last time you felt powerful or not so powerful or whatever you've been feeling, write to us on say hi at Who Run The World Podcast.com. We love to hear from you. Marilyn, it's always a pleasure sharing this microphone with you. It really is. Are you being sarcastic? No, it sounds that I like I am, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to punch you. Don't punch me. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>